in the darkest shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read ancient tomes, the order, the order of the Abercast. We are the brave and bold. Stigmata Studios presents The Jin Jihad The Jin Jihad kicks your face with myths, mysteries, epic battles, suicide bombers, quirky characters, and divine power armor. In this epic graphic novel, the warrior archangels descend on a city in chaos. It's all-out war. The non-standard assembly battles an ancient terrorist organization and their ultimate weapon, a corrected, magically enhanced, unstoppable monster, the Jin. This graphic novel is a wild ride. It's one part distant Arab myth, one part Old Testament angelic vengeance, and one part unique heroic tough guys. Available on Amazon, Get more info on the Jin Jihad and other titles at StigmataStudios.com. Gee golly gosh, Glorsky, thought Mary Sue as she stepped onto the bridge of the Enterprise. Here I am, the youngest lieutenant in Starfleet, only 15 and a half years old. Captain Kirk came up to her and said, Oh, Lieutenant, I love you madly. Will you come to bed with me? Captain, I'm not that kind of girl. <clears throat> You're right, and I respect you for it. Here, take over the ship for a minute while I go and get some coffee for us. Mr. Spot came onto the bridge. What are you doing in the command seat, Lieutenant? And the captain, the captain told me to. Flawlessly log logical. I admire your mind. <laughs> captain Spur S Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and... Okay, just sh knock it off. I'm trying to do a show. No, come on. <clears throat> Mr. Spock. Oh, Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott beamed down with Lieutenant Mary Sue to Rigel. Oh, shit. I guess that's 30. Rigel 37. Yeah, okay. Uh, Knock it off. Come on. Don't make me redo this. Here. You're turning this into a mess. <laughs> They were attacked by green androids and thrown into prison. In a moment of weakness, Lieutenant Mary Sue revealed to Mr. Spock that she, too, was half Vulcan. Recovering quickly, she sprung the lock with her hairpin, and they all got away back to the ship. But back on board, Dr. McCoy and Lieutenant Mary Sue found out <clears throat> that the men who had beamed down were seriously stricken by the jumping cold Robbies. <laughs> Mary Sue, less so. While the four officers languished in sickbay, Lieutenant Mary Sue ran the ship. And ran it so well, she received a Nobel Peace Prize, the Vulcan Order of Gallantry, and the Traumafrandian uh, Order of Good Guyhood. However, the disease finally got her, and she fell fatally ill in the sick bay. And as she breathed her last breath, she was, she was surrounded by Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And Mr. Scott, all weeping unashamedly <laughs> at the loss of her beautiful youth and youthful beauty, intelligence, capability, and all-around niceties. Even to this day, her birthday is a national holiday of the Enterprise. <laughs> this was a Trekkie's tale by Paula Smith. This is where the term... Mary Sue comes from. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. That just means you're a normie and everything's okay. I'm I'm going to explain it all to you. I'm going to explain it all to you right now.
the Abercast, occult, history, conspiracy, violence. Who's, who's daddy's little Mary Sue? Are you daddy's little Mary Sue? Are you good at everything? Are you good at everything, daddy's little Mary Sue? <clears throat> All right, before I get started, I'm John, this is the Abercast. Before we get started on this, I gotta say that this is gonna be just like an end of the week kind of uh, end cap. I've been really holding, I've been keeping my powder dry on this whole solo situation. I know this show is not going to be... Uh, what everybody's expecting so i'm not gonna hold on to it for next week this is just kind of like a bonus show i'm just throwing a bonus show in here but i do got a lot to say so i do need to move it along and this cat's not helping me <clears throat> so that was the the cold open was called a trekkie's tail um it's a mary sue fanfic it's actually where the term mary sue comes from uh, mary sue's prevalent in the in the right now the culture war that is being fought in mainly in pop culture uh but it's echoed it's in real culture too <laughs> it's also just in pop culture and that's actually what we're gonna be talking about tonight uh so before i get too far into this um i do have to do 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 do, do. i got some new uh, itunes reviews um interesting goob 443 gives me five stars and says definitely an interesting show i am enjoying it thank you very much goob 443 i appreciate it <clears throat> i got also a two-star review uh the title of the review is called horrible audio which i don't know i got a big soundboard and microphones and i don't i don't know uh but whatever this is a no judgment zone you're allowed to have your own opinion especially when i click on you and i could see the other reviews that you've done and they're all they're all shitty negative reviews so you know thank you for that uh this person goes on to say, <clears throat> if you like someone burping into the microphone and talking in circles so much you get lost, then laughing at their own jokes. <laughs> this podcast is for you. Sadly, this guy has a wealth of knowledge and his presentation is just so unprofessional, it's unlistenable. So I'm sorry the show is not for you, dude. I apologize. Go check out Mysterious Universe or one of those highly polished, um, highly produced shows. This... This podcast to me seems like more like a couple dudes getting a getting a drink, talking about some weird shit. So I'm sorry the show is not for you. I really am. I wish you would give it a second chance. And if you reach out to me on social media, um, I'd be happy to listen to what you have to say about it because <laughs> that's what the kind of guy I am. Okay, YouTube. You can find the show on YouTube now. Oh, I'd also like to encourage everyone to rate and review on iTunes. I'm liking it. I'm getting uh, more and more reviews. I'm digging that a lot. <laughs> and it helps get some eyes on the show, supposedly. That's how it works. Uh, shows available on YouTube. I only bring this up because I do uh, use other podcast catchers but i also enjoy listening to shows especially if they're long on youtube for you know whatever reason so uh there it is available spreaker packages it up with the bow and throws it up there for me so you'll be able to find that real easy uh we're on patreon the main goal of the patreon right now is I want to launch uh, some kind of book program for soldiers serving overseas. That's really the only thing I got going on for it, as besides having a reason to get some <coughs> mason jars with the, the oath put on it. Um, uh, so uh, I just need help paying for some shipping. I need help with some rounding up some books, and I need help uh, paying for P.O. boxes and whatnot. So that's really what the goal is all about. Not a whole lot of action over there, so I just want to keep everybody reminded of it if it's out there. Um, if you guys uh, want to help make America weird again, that, <laughs> this, this seems like a great way to do it, you know. Um website uh the abercast uh sigmatastudios.com and abercast.com check out the the website over there you can find links to all my social medias there <clears throat> so before i get too far into this i want to say that i'm not going to say the fucking words spoiler alert i fucking hate that that's some kind of millennial bullshit like if 
you're going to get, if your feelings are going to get hurt because you haven't seen the movie that I'm talking about, the movie title is in the title of the show title. You know, I don't know what to fucking say to you. If it's not that important to you to go see it on opening weekend or opening day or whatever, it's not my fucking fault. If you haven't seen the movie yet, stay off Facebook. That's all there is to it. That's the only fucking spoiler warning that's going to be uttered on this. (laughs) Also, I want (laughs) to... Coming out blasting, we are going to get into the culture war here. So I'm going to be saying some things about identity politics. I'm not... I'm not a racist, I'm not a bigot, I'm not a homophobe, and this is the last time I'm going to qualify myself by saying that fucking fucking statement. <clears throat> so, if you're going to knee-jerk react, you're going to listen to part of the show and fucking heckle me or something, listen to the whole goddamn show. Listen to the whole goddamn show. Also, listen to what, uh, oh boy, I didn't even read this before I... Gobele de Alvele says about the migration of symbols written in 1894, son, because that's the feature book for tonight. <laughs> You're like, what does one thing have to do with the other? I'm going to get to it. I'm going to try to stay as dispassionate as I can about all of this. But um, I am very passionate about comic books and Star Wars. Um, and all of these characters that we're talking about are sacred to me. These characters in these stories is how I learned about politics. These characters in these stories learned, taught me about being a man. I fucking owned a, <laughs> I fucking bought a 93 Camaro. It was one of those big fuckers with the eight cylinders in it because, um, well, that and the Millennium Falcon, sure, and, and Smokey and the Bandit. So there we go. So uh, you learn how to be a, I don't want to say you learn how to be a man. You learn how to be masculine from the, these comic book characters that we're going to be talking about shortly and these transcendental movies that we talk about with the the archetypes and all this. I did a a couple episodes when my poor cat died. We did a couple episodes on Joe Campbell's uh, The Power of Myth, the hero with a thousand faces and all that. And we got into the archetype and we got into why these uh, characters and these stories are powerful. And right now we're going to be talking about how the these characters from these powerful stories are now being kind of taken over and written by people that don't have the same values as us people that don't have the same values as the people who made these characters popular and famous and important So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. With that being said, I'm not talking about Star Wars here. I'm not talking about, I'm really not talking about Solo. (laughs) If you want to examine the box office vacuous implosion of Solo, you know, you can find that. You can, there's going to be a million podcasts that can't stop talking about that. There's going to be a million podcasts that are going to critique the movie and probably 60% of them are going to tell you how fucking awesome it is. And then you're going to run into the ones that are going to tell you how completely stupid it is. This movie is divisive. (laughs) We're not going to be talking about any of that. We're not going to be talking about the narrative of the story. What we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, what we're going to be talking about is more of, you know, we're not a movie review podcast, and that's not changing. <laughs> no one, nobody really is talking about the uh, the bigger or the better fan. I'm not going to be calling anyone's fanhood into question. And I'm not, you know, there is this famous neo punk bullshit from like the 2000s. It's like. I'm more punk than you. I think it's like no effects or something like that. You know, that's not what we're playing. We're not playing, you know, I'm more of a Star Wars fan than you were. The real Star Wars fans really boycotted this movie. And the real Star Wars fans really loved this movie. Because, you know, I'm starting to realize that as far as Star Wars fans are considered, some people just need a John Williams score and some fucking Star 
starships and laser blasts and blasters. Um, but some people need more than that. I'm not saying that they're more of a fan. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying maybe they have a higher expectation. Maybe they're bound by a higher expectation of this. Maybe part of their trip, maybe part of their union, their part of their engagement with Star Wars is not being preached to is maybe their engagement, maybe their marriage to the star Wars is um, having it be timeless and not having it be set in some sort of political discussion. So I'm going to get into a lot of this as we go. Instead, we are going to talk about the most sinister and dangerous soldier sweeping across the, our culture we're going to be talking about the social justice warrior and their psychotic need to denigrate and subvert on a fundamental level, alter, alter and uh, alter our beloved characters and make them 180 degree opposites of what makes them great or what makes them important to us. So you're like, I don't know, you're using weird terms now. I don't... You, <laughs> <laughs> what is a social justice warrior? Social justice warrior, I'm sure you know one. At least you've heard one. If you turn on the news, I'm sure if you watched YouTube for more than five minutes, I'm sure that you've run into a social justice warrior. So what's this person is? It could be a man or a woman or a Z or a B or a talking Identif person identifying as a talking rock, you know, whatever. It's an individual who uh, believes this world is inf infected. It's like the force, you know, this toxic masculinity, this uh, overarching tyrannical patriarchy moves through every living thing in the rock and in the tree and in the X wing that submerged in the swamp. It permeates us it powers us so uh, they will fight against it so any social justice cause they will tell you all about it they will tell you about how problematic it is and how it isn't uh the certain aspect of things isn't isn't right they're 99 crazy socialists they're dipsticks <laughs> they probably don't even understand what that means they're like what's a dipstick <laughs> you know they don't watch old dukes of hazard reruns that's the best insult I mean, it would be like uh it'll be like guardians of the galaxy where he calls him a trash panda and he's like is that any better is that any better i don't know i don't know if it's better because millennials these <laughs> social justice warriors are like what's a dipstick <laughs> it sounds like a candy <laughs> All right, so um, not only will they tell you about it, not only will they tell you about how H.P. Lovecraft was a wild racist, he was a racist. H.P. Lovecraft was a racist. He was a rich, old, white guy. Not only will they tell you all about it, and they will preach to you about it until you dismiss them, they will get online, they will start petitions, anything named H.P. Lovecraft, after H.P. Lovecraft, they will petition it to change the name of it because it uh, dis <clears throat> it's uh, disrespectful to minorities that H.P. Lovecraft obviously hated. <laughs> and then if you come out against it, they will bully you on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. They will create an echo chamber around you and shout you down. It, uh, it's the closest thing to physical violence they could possibly do unless they had one of those Antifa's hats on, <coughs> Antifa hats on, or if they get real life confused with V for Vendetta and wear one of those masks. <laughs> So in the last few years, the comic book industry, specifically Marvel Comics, uh, became a battleground of this culture war that we are talking about. I guess we should call it a pop culture war. I don't know, whatever. I'm calling it a culture war. Uh, it became a culture war 
<clears throat> for America, at least. Uh, it, you know, they, these people took over, uh, one of them became the editor in chief and he started appointing all these social justice writers <clears throat> to write Marvel comics. So right now we're talking about the time we're talking about when Marvel comics began the domination of, of the, of the movie industry in America. So at the time we're seeing <clears throat> Robert, we're the time we're seeing Tony Stark, um, an alcoholic white man, an, a rich alcoholic white man. He needs to check his privilege and give that suit of armor over to I don't know a black girl who is super smart, who's Mary Jane. <clears throat> um, Captain America is, you know, uh, he's a World War II vet. He's a white guy. He's r running around with his shield, uh, st st stopping wars or whatever in the movies. Well, in the comic books, they turned him into a Nazi or at least an agent of Hydra. And they replaced him with a black guy who has wings. <laughs> And I'm not saying in and of itself that's wrong. You know, I've read Captain America comic books for a very long time. And there's been many people who wore the Captain America, who took on the mantle of Captain America. But they never made him into a bad guy and then replaced him with his, with his black sidekick. You know, in uh, Iron Man comics in the 80s, uh, Tony took a lot of time off and Rhodey was actually Iron Man. <clears throat> but it it wasn't a replacement for politics sake uh as a matter of fact he also when Rhodey was iron man no one else knew that he was iron man and tony stark wasn't <clears throat> so he wasn't like okay guys i am iron man now okay <laughs> that's right i'm a black man i'm straight and i'm iron man you know, um, Thor, uh, in this time, Thor, uh, he, be, he became unworthy and he lost the power of Thor and it was taken over by a woman. The Hulk became some Asian kid. Spider-Man became some black kid. Hawkeye became a woman. <clears throat> and I, I think there was this gay Nova. So, uh, I'm not going to keep qualifying myself here. I'm just saying, look at the track record. Look what they did to the characters. And then they replace them. Now, <clears throat> inclusion and diversity are not bad ideas. I'm all for it. I actually loved uh, Captain Marvel when she was Monica Rambeau. That was in the 80s with me uh, when I was introduced to the modern Avengers. So I have to kind of explain that. When I was growing up, my dad had some, you know, nowadays they would call them trade paperbacks or some kind of collection. It was like... Uh, the Marvel universe and the, the origin of Marvel comics and the son of origin of Marvel comics. And they had like reprints bound together. So I was earliest introduced to the classic Avengers, the, the, you know, Ant-Man, Iron Man, the Hulk and Thor and the Wasp, of course. <clears throat> uh, but when I got into like, you know, in the eighties, you know, I'm not a, kid i'm kind of graduated from those 60s comic books and i'm catching up and the the avengers uh captain marvel was a black woman she had cornrows and everything and her name was monica rambo and she was awesome <clears throat> so i'm not saying that div uh this diversity is bad but the diversity for the sake of these of this politics jamming these politics into your face taking these characters here's really the theme taking the characters inverting them making thor thor is all of a sudden unworthy and making him lose the power of thor so you have someone replace him that's great it's a woman okay fine whatever actually i think in the 60s jane foster was thor for an episode for an issue or something anyways so this not without saying Thor's also been this guy. He's also been replaced a bunch of times. Famously, my favorite Thor probably is Beta Ray Bill. And he's a fucking alien. He's orange. So it's diversity, uh, to me, it's obvious to me that diversity is not a problem. It's the inversion of the characters that we know and love and have taught us stuff through myth making our entire lives. That is important. Turning around and turning Captain America into a bad guy. That 
is the part that's problem. Making Thor unworthy, that is the part that's the the problem. Oh, fuck, man, I'm all off. I'm not. E- we haven't even really started the thing. I haven't even told you guys to mix up your drinks yet. So inclusion and diversity are not bad ideas. It's the alteration of these established characters. They're being replaced and made into something they are not and sent out into this world to preach to us about their crazy politics or, God forbid, their sexual preferences. There can't be any scrap of media. There can't be any fictional character out there now that we... We must know what gets their dick hard. We have to. We have to know it for the sake of knowing it. We have to know what flag they fly. And I'm going to get into this. Um, I'm going to get into this hardcore when we get into the when we finally get into the solo movie. <clears throat> uh, okay. So now, what I want you guys to do now that was the preamble. You know, we're only like halfway through. So now let's get into the show, shall we? I want you guys to grab your jars. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Grab your jars, fill them up, put your tonic water in there, and fucking strap yourselves into this Millennial Falcon. And let's get going. We're going to do this. We're going to do the Kessel Spice Run. I guess now it's not a Spice Run. They're, they ran to something else. <clears throat> I'm telling you, they need to go back and look at the... Uh, they need to go back and look at... The source material. They need to go back and look at Dune, and in a way they did, now that I think about it. Because at Kessel, there was a droid rebellion, much like the Butletarian Jihad. Dune, I can't wait for the Dune movies. So I don't have, <laughs> so I don't have to put up with Star Wars anymore. I understand and acknowledge that Lucas is a big leftist, and he's always been a big leftist. Um, even when he sold Disney for like 80 million, $80 billion, he was a leftist. He actually had to sell it fast because, uh, Obama's, um, uh, windfall tax, it tax increase was creeping up. This is why he sold it so fast. Um, let's see. Did you where were I at? <laughs> uh, Star Wars always had a political element. I've seen uh, reproductions of original handwritten drafts of the scripts for The New Hope that called the Emperor Nixonian, like he was from the planet Nixon. <laughs> I'm not getting into Nixon here, and I'm also not going to get into Film Critic 101 talk about the actual irrelevance of director directorial intent. I am just saying, full disclosure, acknowledging the political element. The political element that's in the background, the real life political element that's in the background, the political element that's in the background in star, the original star Wars, there was the disillusion of the Senate. There were fighting world war two space Nazis. They were fighting the revolutionary war. I get it. I get it all. I get it all, but it's in the background by taking stuff like the Nixonian emperor out it did not seat the movie in any political historical context. You know, this is unlike L337 raising her fist up and yelling, resist! <laughs> um, I first started detecting this, uh, this outward political commentary coming out of Disney Star Wars. It started to surface after Disney bought Lucasfilm in an episode of the Clone War cartoons where I distinctly remember Padme bitching about how the Republic has money for this endless war against the Separatists, but not, but not enough money for universal health care. And that was the last episode of Clone Wars that I watched. <clears throat> Now, did I stop watching it because I was like, oh, well, now it puts it in a historical context and I just can't enjoy the show anymore. It's no longer in a galaxy far, far away. It's in 19 or it's in 2010 when we're having a national debate against or about uh, universal health care. No, <laughs> that was the last episode I watched because I'm like. They're preaching. It's a cartoon. And now they're propagandizing to children about universal health care. Most, most adults I know didn't understand universal health care. And seeing this on a kid's show just turned me right off. Flip. Uh, not in my wildest dreams did I, un- did I even understand what this was a precursor to. 
and coming and uh we were racing towards it now they were pretty nice to us for uh the force awakens i remember i did resist about force awakens because i was like you know they're taking away the character our characters you know that we want to see i don't know any of these new characters do i really want to get involved in a star wars where now i'm never going to see the end of it they're just going to keep pumping out record-breaking movies after record-breaking movies and forever and ever and are they even gonna mean the same thing like literally (laughs) it was like an anguishing part of my life it was like i'm worrying about ben affleck being batman and i'm worrying about the future of star wars and as history will fucking record at least right now i was right about (laughs) both i was right about both of these worries (laughs) all right i'm gonna um we're going to get into this. We're now in the into the Disney Star Wars, the Kathleen Kennedy Star Wars era. We're going to move in and we're going to start we're going to try to briefly get through this the Force Awakens issue. <laughs> but I'm going to stop real fast and read from The Migration of Symbols by Goblet D. Alavelia, 1894. This is a study of migration and I'm sorry, hold on. <coughs> This is a study of migration and mutation of symbols by a late 19th century Belgian lawyer and Masonic scholar, Count Goublet de Elvillier. Originally published in 1891 in French, this book covers a huge web of interchangeable symbols which are found over a wide range of cultures through the Near East, India, Europe, and further abroad, notably Mesoamerica. He attempts to explain the widespread use of symbols in such as the swastika, the tree of life, the wing-globed, the trident, and the caduceus. A lot of the, some of these things will be known to us here, listeners of the show, the caduceus, the wing-globe, and the tree of life specifically. Uh, Despite the title, D. Avilia does not adhere to one theory, uh, instead, he as a whole, he has a whole toolkit including diffusion, um, mutation, and independent origins, and appropriate and appropriation as well <clears throat> as a psychological, historical, and sociological explanation. He demonstrates that the same symbol can have different interpretations in different cultures and at different times, such as the case with the swastika which today is obviously associated with absolute evil, (laughs) but which has been historically used as a symbol of the sun's yearly path and regarded as a good luck symbol. Even to this day in the far East with over 150 line illustrations, this book, uh, blah, 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 uh, interested in the development of religion. Okay. So we're going to keep that in mind. So the name of the game here on out is the, this is a buzzword. This is actually an SJW buzzword, the appropriation. Instead of appropriation of culture, we're actually talking about appropriation of characters as symbols. Now, we're not going to get into that for a little while. I just wanted to set that up and get it out of the way so we can move on. So... The last, uh, no, sorry, A Force Awakens, we are introduced with a new set of characters as well as degrading our favorite character, Han Solo. <laughs> so we're set up at first, we got this Mary Sue named Ray who can do everything. She could do, the reason she's a Mary Sue, just like the Mary Sue in the cold open, is she could do everything without even trying. She could fly the Millennium Falcon. Do you understand how difficult it would be to fly the mini, the Millennium Falcon? Just its cockpit being off to one side it would be enough to make it super difficult to fly. So a lot of people, when I bring this up, and when I bring this up in casual conversation among, obviously, um, you know, uh, as they would say, a mixed crowd, <laughs> not mixed racially. That, that's another thing is everything's about race with these SJWs. Um, people will point out to me that, well, no, Luke is a Mary Sue. And I don't think Luke is a Mary Sue. Luke has never had a successful lightsaber battle <laughs> in all three movies that we watched him in. 
all, I'm sorry, all four movies that we watched him in, he's never once won a lightsaber duel. <clears throat> Uh, Ray wins a lightsaber duel after first touching a lightsaber at, in the basement of a bar. Uh, she never worked with the drones. She never uh, had to do it blind with the blast shielding of her helmet down. Um, she never had to saw a Wampa's arm off with her lightsaber. She just automatically was able to duel who we can only surmise is like the baddest red sword on the planet or in the galaxy far far away uh she can fly the millennium falcon like it's nobody's business luke luke <clears throat> luke was able to pilot the x-wing specifically because it was flying in it's not the point that he was really good at flying the x-wing the point is that he was really good flying it in the in the trench and this is what he always talked about. It's not, this isn't so different than flying a, well, with T-16 in the shooting Womp Rants back home. He's used to doing that. He trained or whatever. He was good flying in trenches. It's not that he was necessarily good at flying. You could say like, well, it was a land speeder. I don't know if it was a land speeder, the T-62 or whatever. <laughs> that's a tank. I, I don't think it's a T-62, but he might be talking about flying and something else. You know, you were able to make that jump with Anakin. You know, his pod speeder had two engines and the ship that he flew had two engines. So maybe it's the same thing. Maybe Anakin's uh, a Mary Sue. But if that's the case, if Luke's a Mary Sue and Anakin's a Mary Sue, Rey is definitely a Mary Sue. Based on her lightsaber skills alone. Especially since they never went back and revisited it. They never went back and explained it. I always thought was like, oh, she's going to be like a secret student. And Luke had to like wipe her mind and hide her on this desert planet. Nope. <laughs> and she was like tapping into like stuff that she already knew how to do. Nope. Negative. Nope. She just touched a lightsaber once and knew how to use it to defend herself against Kylo Ren. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to get into a touchy subject <clears throat> and that is these SJWs and their, their need to emasculate black men. Um, we're going to get into this Finn story. So Finn's a new character actually out of all of them. He was the one that had the strongest story. I thought they were like, he was a stormtrooper. <clears throat> he was a little, he was a bit too short to be a stormtrooper, but he was a stormtrooper and he was suffering through like PTSD or something. And you're like, man, that's good. This is going to be awesome. Redemption stories are where star Wars is at. Their best characters have redemption stories, as I'm going to talk about. Han Solo left everyone, left everyone, because he was a pirate, he was a scoundrel, he was a mercenary. But at the end, he was like, you know, I might be able to help that kid blow up the Death Star and save the galaxy. <clears throat> and he turned around against all odds. He turned around and risked his life to save his friend. That's a redemption story. Lando Calrissian. Lando Calrissian had a lot of. Um, uh, Lando Calrissian had a lot of problems. He was the administrator of a mining colony. <clears throat> he was faced with a tough decision, and he made his choice to to save his people but betray his friend. What happens in the next movie? Lando Calrissian is a fucking superhero. He's uh he's redeemed himself. He's sneaking into Jabba's palace. He's saving his friend Han. He's flying the Millennium Falcon and destroying the fucking Death Star. That is a redemption story. That's where Finn's story should have been. Instead, by the end of the first movie, he really wasn't a stormtrooper that had seen and done some shit and needed to redeem himself for. Instead, he was just a stormtrooper that was there for like one day, but he spent most of his time as a as a janitor <laughs> and that's something they didn't let up i guess in the um uh the last jedi they use that same joke again i'm like why is the black guy got to be the janitor <laughs> we're gonna get into more of this emasculating black characters here pretty soon also like in the end of the force awakens he he could not hold his own he is not a mary sue because he is not good at everything he does he really had a hard time using that gun and then the gun broke on him basically <laughs> i didn't think about that uh the gun 
his gun broke. He was base. He couldn't do anything with the gun in that in that battle, <clears throat> unless Ray helped him out. <laughs> um. So we have this ma- we have this major thing about emasculating black characters in Kathleen Kennedy Star Wars. And we're gonna get to the cherry on top here in a little bit. Um uh and oh also I can't forget that Han becomes a deadbeat dad and abandons his he abandons his family uh in um The Force Awakens, only to be only to be <clears throat> Pat- what is it? Patricide? Only to be killed by his son with a shitty red lightsaber. <clears throat> so we get in, then we get into Rogue One. And Rogue One is difficult because it's a, it's all about a suicide mission. <laughs> but this starts setting this precedent about, about these Kathleen Kennedy era Star Wars character female star wars characters sacrificing themselves i don't actually know what this is about it's interesting i need to look at it a little bit more but uh so this starts it this kicks off the whole chicks blowing themselves up uh motif that we see just echoing through the kathleen kennedy verse right now that's really all good to say about rogue one it's kind of divorced they don't use any main characters that they could uh subvert or invert or dagger dagger a date but we get into the last jedi (laughs) the last jedi first of all they have to degradate their own character so poe dameron gets turned into this this character who's like this alpha male uh douchebag finn you know he's still a janitor (laughs) and again he tries to commit suicide he tries to sacrifice himself to save the day and he gets stopped again he's emasculated he's a emasculated black man two times now uh this movie is full of strong women uh and people of color who are sacrificing or trying to sacrifice and blow themselves up and uh you get that with if you remember the admiral holdo her purple hair episode we talked a lot about that and uh and actually how the time the way that she did it uh is stupid and it doesn't even fit into the mechanics of the star wars universe (laughs) all right so the big one here at the last jedi is luke skywalker so uh they teased us by showing that picture of him facing off against all the adats and stuff uh they disgraced han in the force awakens uh they turn him into a deadbeat dad then so now it's luke's turn so luke's main character trait besides not being good at anything else (laughs) is his optimism like he's like he's like my friends are in trouble i gotta save them uh leia's in trouble i gotta save her my friends are in trouble i gotta hands in trouble like i gotta go to the cloud the cloud city and save him my father's on endor but you know i still sense some good in him i can save him (laughs) and then all of a sudden they're like nope now luke wants to kill kylo ren um there was the huge thing about the lack of action in the lack of the fan service as far as luke's concerned a lot of people thought like this is it. We're going to see old man Skywalker. We're going to see him in his full capacity. This is like a Liam Neeson style lightsaber duel waiting to happen. Nope. And totally 180 degrees from the established character. And that's a shame. And I think this is actually the shot heard around the It's a Small, Small World. I, I believe that this is what is shaking Lucasfilm and Disney to its core right now. Uh, I believe that fans, I'm not going to say real fans, I'm not going to say whatever, just a certain sector of fans, a certain sector of fans who closed their wallets to this solo movie because of this betrayal of Luke Skywalker. It's the opening shot in in this in this galactic civil war. In this galactic civil war. Now the important thing is like, well, 
is this going to be like a Star Wars narrative to where we can, you know, the rebellion just scores meaningless victories. And even after, even between the gaps of A New Hope and uh, The Force Awakens, we're still faced with an Empire like uh, organization. Like they're, they just changed their name, but it's all the exact same bullshit. That's Disney. Are we stuck in this paradigm where we, we we get these meaningless victories like Solo and nothing ever changes? Just the next movie, they're just like, oh, we're not Lucasfilm. We're the First Order. <laughs> but everything's just the same. Yeah, yeah, we really listen to fans now. We really listen to fans. Here, here's... <laughs> Did everyone know that R2-D2 was a lesbian? <laughs> So now it's time for us to talk about Solo, a Star Wars story. <clears throat> so we get the second round of Solo degradation here. But we go <clears throat> we go to where I draw the straw. So, you know, right now I'm supposed to be telling a story about, you know, Han Solo and Lando or Han Solo and Chewie taking a shower together and all this stuff. I'm like... Just fuck all that. Just forget about all of that. You know, you can blame the kid that wrote it. You can blame the kids that act that directed it. You can blame the kid that the actors in it. Whatever. That's it's just stupid. Like the whole movie is stupid. <laughs> all the crime plots and plans are just they're just stupid. But like I said, I'm going to be dispassionate. I'm not going to get into all that. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about where I drew the straw with this. And this is what happened to Lando Calrissian. Now, you have to understand that to me, Lando Calrissian is a big deal. I spent three years of my life hating Lando Calrissian. Because in Empire Strikes Back, he betrays Han Solo and the Rebels. So he could save his mining colony. And to me, I'm like, no, fuck your mining colony. You need to save Han Solo. Don't help put him in carbonite. That shit's fucked. But as a kid, I hated Lando. And when they were all, when they were all happy and he was wearing Han's clothes, at the at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and he was flying the Millennium Falcon. I was salty as fuck, dude. Salty as fuck. But you know, a few years later, uh, Return of the Jedi comes out, and all of a sudden, Han is a stand-up guy. He's paying his debts. He's helping save his friend. He he's uh, become a general. He's blowing up the fucking second Death Star almost by himself. He's piloting the Millennium Falcon, which is this weirdly shaped fucking ship through the superstructure of the Millennium Falcon. It was mind blowing as a kid. Mind blowing. Who could fucking fly that shit like that? It's crazy. So a week or two before Solo's story, Solo, a Star Wars story comes out. John Kazanin, who's the son of Lawrence Kazanin, who we've talked about on this show, specifically on the Power of Myth, the Joseph Campbell uh, SJW Star Wars, the second episode, when I when I when I got that transcript of Spielberg, Lucas, and Kazanin talking about how Indiana Jones is a pedophile, so uh, he. Lawrence Kasdan has his son, John Kasdan, help him write Solo, a Star Wars story. And um, about like two weeks or so before the movie opened, Huffington Post, without any kind of, I don't even understand why they did it, but they were like, hey, what's up? By the way, John Kasdan, you know, we're interviewing him about writing Star Wars, Solo, a Star Wars story. 
you know, what do you think uh, Lando's sexuality is? And John Kazanin says, well, you know, I believe Lando Calrissian is a pansexual. So there is a tremor that goes around the world. As a child of the 80s, there's a lot of shady movies coming out in the 80s. And a lot of I learned in the 80s that parents do not want to answer questions that are forced on them about weird sex stuff <laughs> that they learn in movies. I've learned this firsthand. I know all about how awkward it can become very fast. So I think that literally this blurb in Huff Poe about Lando's pansexuality was a, you know, as much as I would love to say like, Oh, this soy cot was a big deal. I believe this John Kasdan just being a dick, just not understanding what his personal politics, what his identity politics were going to do to the box office of this movie. I am not saying that the majority of people that stayed away from this movie are anti-pansexual. Whatever the fuck that means. What I'm saying is that Star Wars is, you know... I will say it loosely. It's a family movie. I'm not sure if I would say it's a family movie or it's a movie made for kids. There's some violent, crazy stuff that happens in star Wars a lot, like people catching on fire and not dying and screaming in pain after getting their legs and arms cut off. That's pretty nightmare inducing fuel right there for a young enough kid. And Oh, uncle Owen and aunt Baru getting, this weird blaster that no one's ever seen before that torches dead bodies and just leaves smoking skeletons. That also is crazy stuff. The idea of slavery that is everywhere in the star Wars universe is it's a weird inclusion, but it challenges you. It helps push you and build character. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying about all of this. Now, you have to keep in mind that I just brought up slavery because it's going to become very important here in a, <laughs> in a few minutes. Um, so I believe that John Kaz is just not being able to take a victory lap or just not being able just to hold his tongue really damaged this movie. Because a lot of people, even grown men, since I've been bitching about this on Facebook, I mean, not bitching about it, but like the one thing I did is soon as I heard, soon as I read this thing about pan Lando, I could just call them Pando <laughs> about Lando being a pansexual. I was like, Oh, well his co-pilot in empire Str- or in uh return of the Jedi. That makes sense now. And if you don't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google image search Lando's co-pilot in return of the Jedi and you'll, You'll get a chuckle out of it. I promise. I promise you. Unless you're sensitive. Unless you want to talk to, to me about the negative Asian stereotype of Nine Numb. Let's sign a petition and get his name changed. <laughs> Fucking 30 year old movie. 40 year old. Whatever. How many ever? When I say 30, I still think of the 70s. Because I'm old. So you'll understand my confusion when I went and seen the solo, a star Wars story. And the only references to Lando's pan Lando's sexuality at all is him flirting with Daenerys Stormborn. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? The other allusions to it, We're easily washed away unless John Kasdan opened his fucking mouth and was like, yo, I made Lando gay. Lando's gay. We got the only black dude in a galaxy far, far away, and he will fuck your toaster. He'll fuck you. He'll fuck this cup. (laughs) What, you want him to fuck a Wookiee? He'll take a shower with your Wookiee. He'll fuck your Wookiee. The, um, The idea that Lando is pansexual comes up zero times in the movie at face value. But once John Kazadin says that, so there's this, uh, there's this embarrassingly badly acted scene where Daenerys Stormborn is talking to this, ro- this feminist robot who's like droid rights. This, that I, I'm not going to talk about. I'm actually, I'm just shutting that off. I'm not talking about that droid. 
because I'm not a film critic website. We're talking about these these characters are what's important. So Lando's sexuality is called into play one time in the movie. And it's by this delusional droid. It's by this droid who is crazy. And the droid's like, yeah, you know, Lando's in love with me, but I don't think it'll work out or whatever. Whatever it winds up saying, it's to that gist. And if I didn't know what John Kasdan said, I would have just blown that off. I'd have been like, oh, well, this droid is as crazy and delusional on top of me raging on it the whole time it was on the screen. I was like, oh, okay, so she is just delusional and crazy. And she thinks Lando Calrissian's in love with her and wants to fuck her. But John Kasdan's over here saying two weeks ago, oh, yeah, he wants to fuck that robot. He wants to fuck it hard. <laughs> so you're like, okay, now what? So there's this part in the movie where this droid causes a, a revolt. It, the, it's a droid lives matter SJW droid. And it starts a revolt on Kessel. With, that's a spice mine, but no one goes there for spice. They go there for coaxium or something. And so our boys have to steal some coaxium from a spice mine. I don't, I don't know. Like I said, it's fucking stupid. Um, so this droid gets shot in the middle of this uh, in the middle of this revolt. And Lando Calrissian, who is the smoothest motherfucker. I since I started dealing with this in my head, I try to think about how many metric tons of Colt 45 was sold on the image of Billy D Williams being a ladies man. And now they're just like, I would like to give all the Colt 45 I ever drank. I'd like to give it out away. And I tell you what, you're going to need like a tanker truck. You're going to need a tanker truck. I'd like to give it back to you because he's not a ladies man. Lando, the ladies don't love Lando. Lando might love the ladies and Lando might love L337. Leia. <laughs> Lando loves Leia. Lando loves the ladies and Lando loves L337. So that's where you are. So this droid gets fucking shot. Thankfully, fucking thankfully something exciting and happy happens in this movie. The droid gets shot and Lando like this beta cuck Calrissian like cries and he like runs out in the middle of this firefight and he scoops his droid up who's just dying and I'm like just fucking die already you annoying bitch. <laughs> I think I'm turning into a movie critique podcast right now. So uh this is another instance of just this demasculation, emasculation of black males in the Star Wars universe and in uh in this pop culture war that we're talking about. And this is where I left the movie. I didn't see the one part in the trailer. The trailer didn't look bad. They had those low angle shots with his blaster slung low and I'm like, oh maybe they got this right but they didn't. And, uh, so the, the big shot, the big action piece of the movie is the Falcon doing the Kessel run, getting away from the star destroyer that was like flying through like a vortex hurricane. And it's like flipping around doing like millennium Falcon. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. I apologize. Snowflakes. It's flipping around doing millennium millennial Falcon hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques on TIE fighters. I got up and I left by that point. I didn't even stay to watch that one point where I wanted to see my Camaro ninja kick police motorcycles. <clears throat> I have in my notes, and I didn't even mention the feminazi robot activist droid. But I did, so I'm going to skip that. <laughs> so why? What can be gained by co-opting these beloved characters and inverting them? Changing the essence of these characters. Uh, someone that stands for never-ending optimism and turning them into a, ni a, for a nephew-murdering nihilist <laughs> that milks green milk out of a creature tit and just drinks it without running it through pro any kind of processing. 
<laughs> There's probably some gluten in that green milk. The millennials might not like that. We might have a, we might have to put a warning, put a warning on that milk. It might have gluten. A guy who will fight the odds every time for his friends turns around and becomes a deadbeat dad. A smart, clean, well-smoking urbanite. <laughs> A professional go government administrator and a general and a renowned ladies man turns into this guy who fucks his robot and cucklessly runs out in the middle of a firefight to save his robot that he's trying to fuck. <coughs> like when he greeted when he greeted the Millennium Falcon in Cloud City and the ramp opened and they and the gang came down he didn't grab c-3po's hand and was like well 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 what have we here he didn't do that to 3po he didn't even do it to the plucky r2 who actually has more of a sensuous shape he said that to leia because leia has a vagina and maybe she likes cold 45 i don't know so what can be gained from this abuse, this, uh, you know, appropriation of a uh, character or a symbol? Oh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Sorry about that. We're going to, so we're going to dive into this book, The Migration of Symbols by, I want to keep the call on the guy Goblet, Goblet D. Alvilia. <clears throat> I'll have the right, I'll have the right title typed into the th fucking thing. I can't pronounce French. Uh, so we're going to dive in here. Uh, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we live in the midst of symbolical representations from ceremonies celebrating a birth to the funeral emblems adorning the tube, the tomb from the shaking of hands all around of a morning to applause with which we gratify the actor or lecturer of the evening from these impressions figuring on the seals of our letters to the bank notes in our pocketbooks the pictorial and plastic arts are naught else but symbolism uh, even when they claim to adhere to a servile imitation of reality we write as we speak in symbols and it is the symbols again that we think of those schools of philosophy are to be believed, which affirm our powerlessness to perceive things in themselves. The philosophy of evolution goes the length of proclaiming through the organ of its founder that the conception of force to which it uh, which refers all phenomena is uh, simply the symbol of an unknown and unknowable reality. Herbert Spencer even adds in the most explicit terms uh, that it will always be permissible for us to picture ourselves that reality by concrete symbols so long as we do not regard them as re uh, resemblances of that for which they stand. It is this sense we may apply to the symbol that Professor State Barter uh, has written of the myth. Quote, to create a myth, it is to say, to catch a glimpse of a higher truth beyond a palpable reality is the most magnificent sign of greatness of the human soul and the proof of its faculty of infinite growth and development, unquote. Without doubt, the symbols that have attracted the highest degree of veneration of the uh, the multitude have been representative signs of gods, often uncouth and indecent. <laughs> but we have uh, the gods themselves ever been, uh, except uh, the more or less imperfect symbols of the beings transcending all definition from the human conscious has been more clearly divided through and above all these gods, the sentiment of above all religious sentiments that resort largely to symbolism and in order to place itself in a more intimate communication with beings or abstractions, uh, it desires to approach that uh, to that end men everywhere seen either choosing natural or artificial objects to remind them of the great hidden one 
or themselves intimating that the systematic manner that facts and deeds they attribute to him, which is a way of participating in his life, or again rendering objective by facts. The various, as they are significant, all the gradations of uh, sentiments with which he inspires them, from the most profound humility to the most ardent love. Hence the extreme diversity of symbols, which may be divided into two classes according uh, as they consist of acts or rites and uh, objects or emblems. Uh, we will here occupy ourselves exclusively with the second category or rather with the blah 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 alright so uh, we're going to just skip ahead skip ahead chapter 3 on the causes and alterations the meanings of forms and symbols now remember when I'm t- I don't know how true this is as like a uh, anthropologist or a sociologist, but just for the fact of this podcast, I'm when I talk about symbols, I'm talking about these archetypical characters right now. Cause I'm not actually talking about a pictogram of a cone turning into an a with a man standing in front of it, turning into a cross and an onk. Like I'm not getting into that. This book does get into all that. And it is fascinating. It's fascinating. But I'm trying just to use this as a shorthand to talk about uh, this appropriation of characters, and again, just tw- not and just tw- twisting them and forcing them into something that they're not traditionally. That's the key. Chapter three on causes, alterations, and the meanings of forms and symbols. Three, the cross tradition relates. The Christian missionary, I I need to also, let me just throw a trigger warning at this point. I am not saying Han Solo is Jesus. I'm not saying Lando is the Messiah. Luke Skywalker in his purest form could have been a Messiah figure. You know, I will debate that with you. Uh, But that's not what I'm talking about here. So, let me get back into this. I mean, it's getting fucking late. I've been doing this for... Over an hour now. The cross. Tradition relates that Christian missionaries everywhere overthrew amongst the Belgians the altars of Thor and of Woden. But the fate of the column of Hiddelsheim shows us how a monument of this managed to escape destruction by placing themselves, so to speak, under the protection of the new faith. At Hiddelsheim, they placed the Virgin on the column and transformed into a candelarium. At Liege, a cross uh, was placed on the Peron, and uh, and the oaths which were taken of the sacred white stone can continue to be taken on this cross, uh, which sanctified the ancient simulacrum. In Sweden, also, Sippy or found similar to the one I have mentioned above on the top of which the cross has been incised. Okay. So what this guy's talking about is he's saying that when Christians went in to these, uh, pagan areas to subjugate them and to convert them, they use what was there. So they're talking about this column that people worshiped. So they're like, Hey, we're just going to put a mother of Mary statue right in front of this column. It makes it easier for people to understand. So do you think that the religion of the people that prayed to this column were was much different to, than the religion of the people that were praying to, uh, to Mother Mary? Yes, it was probably wildly different. But because of the small alteration, the change of the symbol, it became not a big deal. It became not a big deal. So... <clears throat> Uh, they're talking about, oh, wait, hold on. They were talking about it. Uh, okay, so uh, among the Belgians, the altars of Thor and Wodan. So the altar of Thor, what would be there? It would be a hammer. Well, what does that hammer look a lot like? The hammer looks a lot like the cross. We actually talked about this at the very tippy end of the Ragnarok episode way, way back. And I suggest everyone go listen to that because that was a great episode. 
And I had a lot of fun with it. But the end of it was about this appropriation of the symbol, the symbol of this hammer turning into the symbol of the cross. This is what we're doing. Someone from a different culture is taking our symbols and transforming them it seems like it's sudden to you to me it's over time because i because <laughs> i could see the past so uh let's see let's see if we can find some more stuff good stuff in here <clears throat> the abbey cochet thinks that the figures engraved at the in remove plate denote the christian symbol because we can find in the catacombs even in the roman architectures the symbol of a bunch of grapes between two peacocks facing one another depicting the soul quenching its thirst in the internal fountain of life nothing however entitles us to distinguish a bunch of grapes in the object placed at the end of the stalk. Moreover, its resemblance to the ordinary representation of the thyrus is inconstatable. Lastly, we have already seen the present day chapter a uh, custom of figuring sacred objects between two winged animals facing one another is spread throughout the whole Mediterranean basin. For, hold on, first of all, this whole thing about these uh, these grapes. These an these animals facing each other that I'm sure. OK, whatever. That's true. But these grapes that they're talking about, this is a uh, this is a symbol of Dionysus. They're not drinking these grapes to pure their to purify their souls. They're drinking these grapes to get drunk. <laughs> and this can actually also be attributed to uh, some Christian mythology because uh, Jesus became Jesus was a Dionysian figure. I know I'm supposed to be talking about Lando Calrissian. I just had to stop there. <laughs> uh, it is special. Uh, it is especially on the side of sacred stones and trees. Yada, yada, yada. We uh, cosmological column related to the Scandinavian Yggdrasil. The is missile. Uh, is just as much connected with the tradition of the universal pillar as it is with the tree of the world, both of which have seemed to receive their first plastic expression among Air Asrio Chaldeans. Now, this tree of life, as you know, I mean, we've all seen Conan the Barbarian. The tree of life also is a crucifix. This was used, again, by the christians who were converting folks in these pagan areas they were like look you guys got a tree we got a cross look at these support hyperboreans you got a tree and a guy nailed to it so do we we got one of those guys too So, I mean, what are we going to, what are we going to do about all this? Uh, what are we going to do about these SJWs <laughs> writers taking, um, taking our characters and twisting them and turning them into the dark shadow characters of themselves or however you want to put it. They're blaspheming these, these characters and they're making them into uh, something that they're, they're not. And this whole time I'm growing up, I hear these things like Star Wars is our modern mythology. And that's a f powerful statement. And on podcasts before, I've really fought against this term, um, comic books are our modern mythology. Uh, I fought against it not because I don't love comic books. I fought against it because most myths, as I just talked about uh, when I was uh, talking about Ragnarok, the Ragnarok episode, most myths come to an end. They're, they come to an end and they're finished. And that usually leads to like the next cycle in that culture's history, or it leads to like a looping back around, or it leads to a different set of s stories, or that's just the end of those myths where uh, comic books have, are, uh, they have mythical things. Their origin stories are mythical, um, but they never, they don't ever seem to end. Uh, which cheapens them. I think that it cheapens them, you know, in a, in a way, <laughs> this is why you have like these time jump alternate realities. This is why old man Logan is cool. Well, everyone loves old man Logan, but when you have regular Logan, you can never make him, you can never travel with him to become old man Logan because people would stop buying the book eventually. It's only cool if you could see it suddenly. This is from this is what happened with Dark Knight Returns. 
the comic book I'm talking about. It's the most influential comic book I've ever read in my entire life. Hand, hands down. Uh, is it takes place in like this alternate fictional 1987 or whatever it was reality. But if you ever took that trip with the character, you, it shakes the apple cart too much. So I, I have, all, I've talked against this idea that comic books are a new mythology, but, but star Wars, I don't know. I don't know. Up until Disney bought it, it seemed like it was, or it seemed like it was a new mythology. It was timeless. Now it's full of references to our to our day. On the nose, button references, not in the background. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to fight it? Yeah, we are. We are going to fight it. And we, and we did fight it. And you look at, you know, I, uh, I implore you, you know, if you're interested in this and you want to see, you want to see this SJW writing just crumble in the face of Star Wars. You want to see the backlash that happens to a global superpower like Walt, the Walt Disney Company just get shook by the power of some fans standing up because they're like, you treated Luke Skywalker like a like a punk. <laughs> so now we're getting a lot of news reports. We're getting a lot of YouTube videos. We're getting a lot of eh, SJW uh, video people on YouTube coming out, talking about it's a, uh, it's about Han Solo being white. That's why pe- no one, no people went and seen the movie. It's about, uh, it's about star Wars fatigue. There's been too many star Wars movies too fast. It, it, and the people, dis- the people saying this, are doing it straight face. They're not saying it in a ham handed, stupid fucking way. Like you're talking about star Wars fatigue. You just announced you're releasing a fucking TV show. (laughs) They're saying it. Their brother fucking like whatever Marvel comics is ruling the world with like 16 white men, main characters. They're ruling it. They're ruling like 60, 40. I don't know. I'm not a fucking mathematician and I'm not a fucking movie guy. I mean, I like fucking movies. I don't like fucking movies. I like movies, but I don't get inside baseball often. So I think that they have to be at like 40 to 50% of of movie based revenue right now. People are buying Marvel toys. Star Wars toys are rotting on the shelves, rotting on the shelves. If you guys are interested in any of this stuff, you want to get into like some hardcore critique. Uh, you want to talk about some marketing decisions. You want to talk about these ancillary things like the, like the toys. I, uh, want you, you should reach out right now. You should go on YouTube and find Ethan Van Scriber's, uh, comic book pro secrets youtube channel he is on top of this i'm attacking it at on a sort of a different a different avenue a different way i'm trying to stay away from the stuff that he's talking about but uh he go get daddy's belt and go visit uncle ethan and um that's it for this episode please go check out the website stigmata studios.com check out um Uh, find me on social media let me know what you think about this what do you think do you think i'm wrong do you think it is about white white men fatigue do you think it's about star wars fatigue uh do do you mind that your characters are getting twisted and totally turned into bizarro versions of the traditional views of these characters do you care about that do you see it are you one of these kind of guys that are like just put a john williams score in and show some blasters and some spaceships and i'm fine with it i'm fine with it i'm shocked to find that like probably 60 percent of my news feed loves this fucking movie but they hide it they don't say they love it they say it was fun it was a blast i really enjoyed it (laughs) you have a movie about the most famous star everyone's favorite star wars character and you are tanking at the box office you're doing something wrong listen to your fans kathleen kennedy fire kathleen kennedy never give jonathan kasdan a job writing again probably the same thing with lawrence kasdan 
Get all new people in there. Fix it. Fix it fast. Or you know what we're going to do? We're going to fuck you and we're going to fight you. Just like Soda Jerk. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Uh, this is not the episode for next week. I will have a new episode. This is just a one-off. I need to rant. I need to get all this shit out of my system. And I had this <laughs> I had this very hard to pronounce French book, The Migration of Symbols by Goblet D. Tony Alba out there. And I need to talk about Tony Alba. <laughs> I have a Tony Alvick skateboard. <laughs> I love you. Leave some reviews, please. All right. Bye. Wait, what did I do? Here we go. I fuck droids. I fight droids. She made me sick that night. I knew that my whiskey would take up my life. Do 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 Except for Not Ray. even the crack, crack of Ray is safe. So I took, took a shot of whiskey and say goodnight. The whiskey it makes me wanna fuck and fight. I fuck and fight. Fuck and fight. The whiskey it makes me wanna fuck and fight. The whiskey it makes me wanna fuck and fight. The whiskey it makes me wanna fuck and fight.